perhaps you could both tell us in succession how you got attracted to the idea of composing music. That's not the easiest path to choose. I know, I'm a woman organist. There aren't so many of us. People ask me this all the time. How did you get started with such a strange instrument? So uh, choosing to be a composer is a challenging, is a challenging path. How did you get started? Well, um, I, I have kind of an unusual um, path to it. I, I'm self-taught, and um, some of my earliest memories were like the uh, play. When I was three years old, I was living with my grandparents, and we had piano, and I'd go out before anybody woke up and plunk around, which I'm sure I woke everybody up after that. You know, till I was in my um, uh, mid early 20s, and I stayed at a friend's house, and they had a grand piano, and I did the same thing I did when I was three years old. I went to the piano and started making up things, and I felt like I really loved doing it, and so I went back to where I was living in Boston, and I went around to antique stores and asked if I wanted to get a piano, so I asked if the pedals and the keys worked, and they'd say, yeah, you can try it, and I said, oh, no, no, I don't play piano, so, you know, but that's how I got a piano, and um, started making up things, so that was my intro into composing. At the time, I didn't know how to read music or write music, and that came later. Well, I was born with a sound orientation, um, and I'm very sound-focused and very slow and meditative in general. Tonight, you'll be hearing notated music of mine, music that's written on paper for performers to perform. I'm also a sound artist. So I consider myself both a composer of not notated music and a sound artist. And my focus on sound goes through all of my work. And my mom tells stories about when I was a toddler and I would take glasses of water and carefully drop rocks into the water and put my ear in it and just listen and be with the sound. So I feel like I was born with the orientation, but then my mom was also a musician. She's a folk musician and an improv-oriented musician. Right now she's working as a musician for dance, which means she improvs music for dance classes and makes music for dance concerts. So I had that intro to it, and I went through formal study starting when I was 16 in the conservatory program. What other musicians influenced you once you found that you wanted to make music? What other musicians encouraged that? Well, I think before I became decided I wanted to compose, I think um, discovering certain composers was, you know, inspiring um, from Stravinsky, but through different ways, like Fantasia. When I was a kid, um, what stuck with me was Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Not so much the images, but the music, and um, Satie, and Debussy and uh, those musicians. Um, and then after I started composing, it was other composers who started influencing me and inspiring me. Most of all, to develop my own voice. Um, go ahead. Kelly? <laughs> I was influenced by seeking out women composers, actually. I mean, from early childhood. I got that there was something wrong in music. And I was always teaching my teachers about the women that they should be including in their curricula. So I was very involved with <coughs> French composers too and became really interested in you know, starting with Louis Bourget, um, moving through the 20th century now, Kai Zaria was a big inspiration. Shulamit Ron is another really exciting, I think, underrated composer. Um, people who have strong voices and a sort of clarity of expression I'm not necessarily inspired by people with my same aesthetic. I'm inspired by people with clarity, focus, passion that I can hear. Were either of you interested in the dance? Because the dance was so much of Stravinsky's world in Paris <coughs> in the early 20th century. Did that interest you as well? Diaghilev's work in the Ballet Russe? Mm -hmm. 
and you. It, it didn't, uh, at that time when I first started composing, I wasn't aware of it. But I have always wanted my music <coughs> to be set to dance. If anybody is listening, <laughs> if anybody's connected with choreographers, I, 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 I love dance. And I think I would love, I love settings of music, you know, dance settings of music. And I was part of that world because my mom was. So I started accompanying dance classes when I was 15 or 16. And I started understanding that power of improv and specifically making music that moves a room full of bodies. Yeah. Very powerful. Were you also influenced by Stravinsky's moving away from stringed instruments and increasingly using wind instruments as he went through his career because of the precision of the articulation? Was that something that either of you or both of you thought about? I love Symphony of Songs. Yeah, That's we're, we're doing it this year. Stay tuned. The big choir is like the big choir is singing December 8th. That's right. I would love to sing that. You want to come and sing? It's why I hope it's coming and sing. It's coming and sing. Um, have both of you had residences in some of these uh, creative colonies, which give you quiet time to think and compose and, and be in a situation where you can take time away from whatever work you might have to do at an institution, but get away from the city life and get out into the country? Kayla can speak to that. I can, residencies are a big part of my and I love talking with students about them because if I could give myself one global piece of advice, uh, if I could go back in time, it would be to think about residencies earlier and more seriously than I did. It's so valuable to have that kind of support. And I'll describe it a little more clearly. Um, usually an artist residency is literally no responsibility for anything other than your work. So I've just come from one where the only decision you have to make is how to structure your day. And the only time you have to interface with other humans is at dinner. You sit down at dinner and food just appears and you don't have to think about what to cook or how to clean or what your family needs in terms of food. You're just alone and supported. And that's been incredibly important for me. But I know other kinds of travel um, I was I went to Brazil recently, um, and um, they had, for a, I was at an industrial town uh, northwest of Sao Paulo, and uh, I worked with the New York Women Composers Organization, and we have a program um, of seed money grants that we give to performers, soloists, ensembles, um, presenting organizations, and festivals and schools, um, and. This festival in Brazil received a seed money grant. And so um, for the first time, they were doing a concert of women composers <coughs> and also um, doing some premieres of women's works. And um, I went down there, and um, it was really amazing because as with the residency, I got so much from it because I was one of the featured Composers, but also um, I was representing the New York Women Composers, and a lot of people had never met a woman composer, and a lot of people cannot name a woman composer, so it was really great, and they did a, a piece of mine for um, so, a violin soloist and string orchestra, and the violinist was a woman, the soloist, and they got a student conductor a woman student conductor to, to um, conduct the piece. And it was just great. And the passion, um, one of the things I know you get from residencies is the community, the sense of community, which is so important for art. And um, the people at the festival were just wonderful and so passionate about contemporary music and classical music. And it was just a beautiful experience. Were the, were the orchestral musicians students, or were they professionals? They, they were students, adult student, um, student musicians, who some of them are um, pursuing careers as, as professional musicians. 
but some of them are just um, working very hard and, and being musicians, but they also work in other jobs and stuff. And this is a chance, the festival each year is a chance for them to study with um, master musicians. So Do they come only from Brazil or from other countries like yourself? This is pretty much uh, only in Brazil and it's a free, it's free, <coughs> which is great. Yeah, that really is it's wonderful. It's great. It makes it affordable for people who are working to come and study. That is associated with a school or is it just a festival on its own? It's a school in a, in a small, well not small, but in an industrial town in Brazil, uh, northwest of Sao Paulo, like 200 miles northwest. And the school is also free for younger students. It's, it's great. And where have your travels taken you? Oh. Is your music performed internationally? Have you, have you gone to some of the premieres of your pieces? Mostly not. I go to about 10% of my performances. I have um, 50 or 60 a year, and there's no, there's no way to get to all of them. Well, almost all of them are not involving funded travel. Mm -hmm. And I need to be really careful about travel because I have an eight-year-old son. I don't like to be away from him for a long time. And to the extent that I'm away from him, I want it to be really concentrated work or meditation kind of oriented time. So I between five and ten percent, I would say I hear almost none of my performance. <laughs> Which is it feels it feels good in a way because I want the music to have a broader life than I have. I mean my music will always be more broadly traveled than I am, which is a great thing. It is. I've only been to nice. those. Um, that's a nice that's way a nice way of putting it. Uh, I guess I've been to about ten countries. Mm -hmm. So it will always outpace me in the number of countries. In, in thinking about your work overall, um, is there a particular commission or a particular piece that you were very excited to get the opportunity to play or to work with a particular group of musicians? That, that's all, well, and, you know, it's, it, it's rare to get wonderful commissions that you were really seeking and hoping to have the opportunity. And then when you have that, it's often very fulfilling. I hear from other colleagues, so could you speak to that? Uh, certainly for me, that group would be The Crossing, mm -hmm. which is a phenomenal new music focused choir. Um, I was able to write a piece for them two years ago, and they, they're a group of people who they've just they've come together to devote their lives to choral music. It is sort of the definition of a professional choir, and they are phenomenal. They sight read a piece that other choirs don't even think they can touch. How many members are in the group? Sixteen. Mm -hmm. Well, it varies. It can range from sixteen to twenty-four. And where are they um, in residence? They are based in Philadelphia, actually. I'm mm -hmm. lucky enough to be very close to them, mm -hmm. but. Um, that was a phenomenal experience. I was part of a fellowship where I was actually sort of embedded with them. So I wrote for them, but I also got to sit in on some of the rehearsals, and it was just like baseball fantasy camp. I was <laughs> singing in among my heroes. It was thrilling. And how long was this fellowship, and, how, and who sponsored the fellowship? Just for a week. And it was at, um, it was at a performing arts center in Big Sky, Montana, of all places. It's a ski resort. They just happen to have a beautifully funded performing arts center. So they bring the best groups in many different genres. Mm -hmm. And they brought the crossing there, and they bring some singing fellows and some composing fellows. And the beauty of something like that is that now I'm working on a commission for one of the people who was one of the singing fellows, and he has a group that he's conducting. So there are always all of these tendrils that reach so, so one inspiration leads leads to another. Mm -hmm. Can you speak the same thing? What was a wonderful commission or an opportunity to write a piece that you just wanted to be able to work with particular musicians, and it all worked out? Actually, I I have not gotten commissions. Okay. So I've gone like a whole different way of just okay. writing the pieces. But I have to say that um, because I am self-taught and I don't play an instrument, um, I'm in awe of musicians. It's like, oh, you know. I, mean, I am too, by the way. That know, doesn't relate to formal training. I mean, I'm in awe of performers. Yeah, and um, 
I just, it, you know, you can, you can write the music, you hear it in your, you know, you hear it and I hear the MIDI, um, but there's nothing compared to musicians breathing life into a piece of music. And the level of subtlety and the phrasing and the, um, just, just, they'll ask, musicians will ask me questions like, um, you know, um, phrasing or bowing or, or things like that. And I just say, <laughs> you know, I defer to you, you know, um, because what you do is you, what musicians do is breathe life into the music. And um, so I'm just very grateful. And that has been inspiring to hear different musicians, from student musicians to professional musicians. Um, it's just every time you hear a piece performed for the first time, it, it's just amazing, you know? So the, the choral piece, I don't write vocal music, and I know this is, I've written one choral piece, <laughs> and so this will be the premiere of this choral piece. Oh, cool. And it will be amazing to hear, I know. <laughs> We've had fun working on it, even counting. <laughs> Everybody's laughing back there. They're counting even as we speak. In <laughs> that moment, oh. I agree so strongly because there's a sacred moment of feeling people put their whole attention into the piece. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I think of kind of like a parabolic mirror, mm -hmm. which is there is the performer's focus, and then there's a reflection of the audience's engagement with that focus. That is so beautiful. Yes. And they are mutually amplifying each other. So you get this effect of people being silent in a room together, which is so weird these days, and so precious. And the performers are at the heart of that. And also, when you're composing, you know, you're in this kind of zone mm -hmm. of energy and, and feeling the music you know, somehow come through you or in some way. And so when you see the performers in that same, I mean, they go into that space too in a whole different way. But, but then you're part of the audience watching the reincarnation of that kind of energy right. into in the piece. And they're amplifying not just your voice, but the text if it's a vocal piece. Yes. And that's something that's very important for me, too. Uh, most of my vocal and choral pieces are focused on amplifying texts that need amplification. Like Blue Phoenix is a great example. It's part of a long-term project called Access of Beauty, which is 14 years old at this point. It started in 2004, <coughs> and it was my response to the Access of Evil propaganda that was trying to reduce an entire region to one faceless mass of people. So the point of Blue Phoenix and Pieces Like It is to take individual statements from people whose voices need amplification and help those voices be part of that whole process of focusing for the audience. Well, I think this touches on something in the society that I worry about all the time. I'm watching everybody become visual Mm -hmm. And everybody is madly looking on their telephones or their tablets, and I wonder how well they're listening. So speak about listening and audiences and how it's so important to have quiet time to listen, and how that's part of what the, the creative process for a composer. You're trying to get people to listen in a very uh, personal and fulfilling way, that listening in itself has value in the society. This society is forgetting that sort of thing. And I'm always trying to teach it in classes and teach it with the choirs. So right. speak to right. that as composers. So, so one of the things I would tell any composer, and I would also, is one of the most essential things to um, composing, and also I think it's applicable to musicians, is um, for a composer, it's finding, it's allowing um, space in your life for, without, um, without distractions, without um, oral distractions all the time. I mean, you need 
space that's, that's quiet because without that space, you don't hear the inner voice. There's no time for, it, for your inner voice to emerge because you constantly have input going on. And you can't, you can never write that way. You can never, the music never has a chance to surface. And I think for musicians, it's the same thing. If you're constantly hearing something, you start numbing those, those sensory, that sensory capability of, of degrees of subtlety. And for musicians working together, you need that degree of subtlety to pick up on what's going on between you all the time. Um, I was going to write a children's book one time because I used to teach in, in public schools, uh, elementary schools, and um, as an art school work teacher, and general music. And I was going to write a children's book about um, a character who goes around with, um, you know, Walkman on all the time, earphones <laughs> on all the time, iPad, uh, iPod, <laughs> you know, whatever it was. Back then it was a Walkman, but, um, and all of a sudden his Walkman or his iPad pod um, breaks and he can't, he doesn't have earphones on anymore. And all of a sudden he hears a sound and it's a bird, but he's never heard it before. And he gets startled, like, what's that? What is that sound? You know, and it's kind of like, come on people, you know, you know, you need to open yourself up to the world around you. And so I have concerns not only about the visual thing, um, but the oversaturation of music all the time, you know, um, everywhere, everywhere. So there's no quiet space in society. It's about sound, and it's also about awareness of connectivity. I'm not actually, I'm not at all in the camp of people who are, well, I'll say I'm troubled by a lack of choice in connectivity, but I love connectivity. I love oh, I do too. Facebook, social media, being able to be genuinely friends. I mean, I count among my friends some people I've never met. I think that's magical. There's nothing wrong with that, but the, the wrongness perhaps is people not making that space and taking that time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit about um, instrumental versus vocal? Rain yeah. said she wrote one piece which we're singing tonight, but you've had lots of vocal pieces. Um, I have other composer friends who are women composers who play exclusively instrumental music, write no vocal music at all. Um, how, how has your compositional life been shaped or inspired by the medium as for human voices as opposed to humans playing instruments or electronic means because some composers are doing this also right. using computers to we had a composer about a year ago who does doing a lot with computers well i, I am doing that i would say mm -hmm. that i'm i usually choose 70 30 as my percentage so i'm 70 percent <coughs> focused on notated music 30 percent focused on audio mm -hmm. And instrumental also? Of that 70%, most is vocal because there's sort of a snowball effect. Like I've done so much choral music and I've been fortunate enough, enough to work with a lot of really great choral groups that um, when people are coming to me now in terms of like someone just wanting a piece for me who's a stranger, it's mostly choral conductors. So I'm a little bit wary of that snowball effect. I don't want to be pigeonholed as a choral composer, and I don't want to not leave the space for myself to expand beyond it. But I love choral music. I love it, and I miss it. I miss it so much. And I, my life just isn't conducive to being part of a chorus right now. But the best times of my teenage years were choral singing focused times. And um, my flight instrument, I went to Eastman School of Music, which is a conservatory of state, and my flight instrument there was voice. So I was actually a very serious singer for about five years before I was focusing just on composing. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Well, um, I've always been drawn to instrumental music, and I was lucky when I was drawn to start composing to go to an instrument like a piano, which you don't need any technique to make a good sound. So that was kind of important. I was able to make a good sound immediately, mm -hmm. and so could go into the music. Um, it's an interesting, so I would say 97% of my music is <laughs> instrumental. <laughs> so <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> that looks so I have two um, vocal pieces and this one choral piece. Um, but it's an interesting thing in this time, in this age, um, with the political environment, I'm not going to get into politics, but with the political environment being what it is, um, so much music is happening right now, and so much vocal music is happening that is using texts, like you said, that need to be amplified, um, sentiments that need to be amplified in society. And as an instrumental composer, it, I, it, it's hard sometimes um, to have the faith that the music you write that's just instrumental without the direct message through words is still valuable. And um, I think it is because what instrumental music does is it also takes people to places that words don't describe. And so I have to kind of keep saying, you know, even though I'm not being direct in the messages to, to engage people in feelings and thoughts and deeper connections, that instrumental music has that power to do it still. Mm. You know, so I completely agree with that, and I'll take it a step farther which is the reason that we are, well, we don't have time for all the reasons that we're in the political situation we're in, but I will talk about commerce and commodification, and specifically commodification of energy and passion. We're living in a culture where profit is such a driver that it obliterates ethics, and it obliterates caring. And whenever we do something that's not measurable in those terms, that is a direct action against the culture. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe that the power structures right now are dependent on commerce. Mm -hmm. And we are dependent on something other than commerce, something more elevated than commerce, something more inward and more community focused. And that's essential. And more transcendent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's kind of like when money becomes everything, uh, life is devalued. Exactly. Focus is devalued, caring is devalued, human connection is devalued, human agency, human lives, of course, are devalued. Mm -hmm. And lifting hearts and minds is what music is all about, in mm -hmm. essence. Reaching out without words or with them mm -hmm. and reaching people spiritually in a way that has nothing to do with anybody's faith tradition. It's stronger. It's just one's humanity connecting with audiences. That's the powerful thing that musicians have the grace and blessing to be able to do. It's such a privilege all the time. Exactly. Well, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.